Load balancing requests between compute resources is managed at the networking level via either a load balancer or an application gateway depending on your needs. Let's take a closer look. In this lesson, we will discuss the features and drawbacks of the Azure Load Balancer and the Azure Application Gateway. We'll also discuss which of these two options is the better choice for a given deployment and when it's even appropriate to use both. Azure Load Balancer is a Layer 4 routing option. What that means is it operates at the transport layer of the networking stack, or, in other words, it can operate in properly routing TCP or UDP traffic. It provides routing among several virtual machines and, in the case of Classic or Azure Service Management deployments, it also supports platform-as-a-service cloud services. Load Balancer can be used in hybrid networks, that is, a combined on-premises and Azure virtual network. Reserved IP addressing is supported, as is port forwarding. Routing and session affinity is based on tuples, or a hashing of the IP addresses, ports, and protocols used for each transport session. As a result, Load Balancer supports session affinity based on hash or tuple. There are internet-facing and internal versions of Load Balancer. In the internet-facing version, Load Balancer maps the public IP address of your virtual network to the private IP addresses of your virtual machines in that network. This is bidirectional. Both requests to and responses from each virtual machine behind an internet-facing load balancer is routed through the load balancer. There is the exception of direct server return, which we'll touch on shortly. An internal load balancer routes traffic around from within the Azure virtual network itself. This comes in several different flavors. We can use an internal load balancer to balance traffic between virtual machines within the same virtual network or the same cloud service. In a hybrid network, we can load balance the VM traffic in both the same cloud service and virtual network when speaking to the on-premises network. And we can load balance traffic among tiers of virtual machines in a multi-tier application. For example, if my application has a data tier and a processing tier, I can put both the data tier VMs and the processing tier VMs behind their own internal load balancers. Then, whenever a request is made for my presentation tier, maybe it's a web app, the request will be load balanced to my processing tier. If the processing tier virtual machine then needs to make a data request, its request will be load balanced by the data tier internal load balancer. While this makes for a somewhat more complicated network topology, it should markedly improve performance since every request across all tiers of the application are being load balanced for each session. So, what are the strong suits of Load Balancer? Primarily, they are flexibility and performance. Load Balancer allows me to route any kind of traffic across my virtual network. I can create port forwarding and persistence rules. I can even opt to send traffic directly back to the client, bypassing the Load Balancer if I'm worried about traffic bottlenecks. For example, I would probably want to bypass the Load Balancer if my VM is sending back to the client something that is bandwidth intensive such as a streaming video file. This is called direct server return. An internal load balancer allows me to create robust N-tier architectures by placing each tier of the application behind a load balancer. When properly designed and configured, this should ensure maximum performance, especially if the load balancer should correctly address scaled out virtual machine instances once I enable auto-scaling of the VM set. Finally, because a single load balancer can handle multiple virtual IP addresses or public IP addresses, I can use a load balancer to host multiple port listening services across the same set of virtual machines. For example, I could set up a web server farm on, say, five virtual machines. Each of those VMs would serve a different website depending on the port being used to connect. By setting up my load balancer to forward each unique IP address, to a different port, I could therefore use those same five VMs to host many different websites, all on the same hardware. Finally, I can customize my load balancer's health probes. Depending on how my endpoints are set up, I can have the load balancer take the endpoint offline if I detect some undesirable state on the virtual machine. For example, maybe I have an existential service on this machine. I could detect through my software running on that VM whether that service is running.
If not, I can have my VM respond with a non-200 status code to the Load Balancer's health probe. When that happens, the instance will go offline and Load Balancer will no longer send it traffic. There aren't many drawbacks to the Azure Load Balancer. If I want to be picky, I can note that the routing rules inherent in the Load Balancer aren't very granular. I can specify a destination based on the protocol, UDP or TCP, the source IP address and the source port, but I can't refuse connections based on those parameters, for example. Also, Load Balancer does not support SSL offloading. This means each virtual machine behind the Load Balancer must do its own decrypting of those requests, which does introduce some overhead. Finally, it can be tempting to misuse Load Balancer. In some cases, you need to route traffic specifically to a specific virtual machine. And you could do so with Load Balancer. But this is an anti-pattern for the cloud, especially if you want your resources to be scalable. If you configure a specific machine to handle all the requests from a given source IP address, for example, then you can't scale that machine out because the Load Balancer can't send traffic from that source IP to any place else. This stymies your ability to handle unexpected traffic events and also means your solution is susceptible to downtime as that single VM may need to restart or worse, decides to crash. Finally, Load Balancer uses HTTP probes and status codes to monitor the health of the virtual machines it is balancing. As a result, your VMs must have a web server running on them and respond with a 200 OK status code to the Load Balancer's GET requests. If your VMs don't do that, Load Balancer will take them offline. So when is it appropriate to use the Load Balancer? Well, you use the Load Balancer to balance each tier of an N-tier architecture, to balance all the traffic on a specific IP address or group of IP addresses, to coordinate traffic between a virtual network and the on-premises network in a hybrid network, and to direct traffic on a specific port or from a specific IP address to a specific virtual machine. Now let's talk about Azure Application Gateway. Application Gateway provides load balancing services at Layer 7, or the Application Layer. In other words, it balances traffic for requests to a specific application, namely a web server. Application Gateway provides WebSocket support, so if you have a modern web application that emulates a stateful connection to a client, such as a web chat application, you can put your WebSocket-driven components behind an Application Gateway. Application Gateway includes a web application firewall that protects against common attacks such as SQL injection, cross-site scripting, and session hijackings. This feature is currently in preview. Routing is managed by the form of the requesting URL. Requests are routed round-robin, meaning each HTTP-based service behind an application gateway that is set to respond to a specific URL will have an even chance of handling a request. In those cases where traffic must be routed to the same virtual machine, such as a shopping cart, cookies are used to maintain session affinity. A major bonus of Application Gateway is SSL termination and handling. An Application Gateway will take over the computationally expensive task of decoding SSL requests and provides end-to-end -end SSL processing, meaning the VMs behind it have a significant burden removed from them. The Application Gateway service comes in two SKUs, Standard and Web Application Firewall. As the name suggests, if you want to use the Web Application Firewall in your Application Gateway, you need the WAF SKU. Otherwise, you use the Standard SKU. There are three service tiers, Small, Medium, and Large. The primary difference among them is the speed of which they process requests, the cost of outbound data, and the amount of free data output you get per month. It is unlikely Exam 70-534 will ask you about specific differences among the service tiers, so I won't get into them here. It is worth noting that all inbound traffic is free for all service tiers. It's also important to know that a small service tier does not support web application firewall. So, let's take a moment to talk about web application firewall. This software protects you against the most common forms of web attacks, such as SQL injection and cross-site scripting, known bots and scanners, problems with each HTTP request such as forgeries, protocol violations and missing headers, and common server misconfigurations. It runs in detection or prevention mode. Detection mode will log suspicious activity but won't directly alert you about it. It will also allow the activity to continue. 
Protection mode will return a 403 error to the client whenever a problem is detected and will also log the incident. Again, you won't receive a direct alert about prevented incidents. There are several pros to using Application Gateway. They're considerably easier to configure than load balancers. Just create your gateway, assign it to the inbound IP address in a virtual network, add a listener, and you're all done. The process is a little more complicated if you are using SSL offloading. In that case, you do need to configure in the SSL certificate you plan to use, plus add a rule to do the decoding and encoding. Application Gateway in the WAF SKU can protect you against common web attacks, and it works for public and private IP addresses. Like Load Balancer, you can create custom health probes for an Application Gateway too. There are some drawbacks to Application Gateway. Notably, because it works at the application level, it only works for HTTP or HTTPS requests and therefore isn't very flexible. Routing is primarily done via round robin, but it can also be assigned based on the requesting URL, so you don't have a lot of say over which virtual machine handles each request. You can't use a reserved IP address with an application gateway, that is, your virtual network or cloud service must use a dynamic IP address when you use an application gateway. And load balancers have stricter rules about what constitutes a dead endpoint. Application Gateway gives a VM up to 30 seconds to respond to a probe and takes it offline after 5 failed live traffic requests. Load balancers consider an endpoint idle after 15 seconds and takes the instances offline after 2 failed live traffic requests. So when do we want to use an Application Gateway? When we want to protect our virtual machines and web apps that are in a virtual network against common web attacks through the web application firewall. When we want to route traffic among several different web server VMs or web apps that are in a VNet within a specific VNet. We can use them in concert with a load balancer for multi-tier applications and to maintain session affinity for specific applications such as shopping carts and webmail and the like. Also, if our workload is SSL intensive, an application gateway really makes a difference. Finally, we can bring together load balancers and application gateways into a unified approach to load balancing. This is typically done when your application is tiered into a web-based presentation layer with data and compute layers backing up that presentation tier. For example, suppose you manage a bicycle rental business. You have a web app that lets people book, return, and pay for bicycles. A data tier would be used to hold on to which bicycles are where, which ones are currently rented, and when they're due. That data tier would also hold on to customer information. It would communicate directly with the compute tier, but not the presentation tier. We would apply an internal load balancer to the data tier's VM subnet to ensure the data machines are properly isolated and that the workload from the compute tier is spread out among them. A compute tier would be used to help customers find the nearest rental location, review their rental histories, create a new rental, and process payments. That tier would communicate directly with the presentation tier. Again, here, we would apply an internal load balancer to coordinate traffic with the presentation layer. The presentation tier would, in turn, use an application gateway to manage external traffic on its public IP address. In addition to spreading out the public requests across all presentation VMs, the application gateway can also protect us against attacks via the web application firewall. The application gateway will also ensure that our reservation requests are handled by the same web server VM, and the load balancers between the compute and data tiers would preserve sessions for each internal request made when processing that reservation. So, acting in concert, our two internal load balancers and our public-facing application gateway ensures the workload for each request is as efficient as it can be while simultaneously protecting us from attack, keeping each user session straight, and ensuring the requests are not crossed over. That's it for this lesson. When you're ready, let's wrap up here and check out the demo.